Hey everybody, and welcome to my How I Made Starlink Better video. Now, um, before I get too deep into this, this is a remake of a video I had done a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of wanted to redo it for a couple of reasons. Thing number one, I, I there's some information that I felt was missing that I wanted to add in here, as well as that video was just too long. Um, me babbling for 45 minutes plus is not... It's not something I think we the world needs. So, um, But I did want to remake this because I think there's some good info here for people that are looking at Starlink in the same kind of light as what I'm looking at it for, uh, or the same kind of use case. So a little bit about that. So as of right now in June, uh, late June of 2022, I live in Metro Boston, Massachusetts, and... I have great availability to high-speed internet here, whether it's through cable or fiber optic. Um, you know, we have that here. It's not an issue. And I don't need Starlink. I mean, I don't need it at all. But I have it. So why do I have it? Well, reason is um, all that is going to be changing for us. Um, we're in the process right now of moving out of our house, and we're moving into an RV full-time, and we're going to be traveling. 100% of the time. Um, neither of us is, are anywhere near retirement age, so we're both going to continue to work from the road. And things that, you know, at least for my job for certain, and probably for hers too when the time comes, we need, you know, good speed. Um, we also need high availability and low latency. And, and that's kind of where I think Starlink somewhat fits the bill for us is it ticks off some of those boxes. Um, so back in February, when SpaceX could actually get me a dish um, in my local area, I jumped at the chance. I ordered one, got it here, and I've been testing it ever since. And this video is kind of what I've done to improve Starlink to make it work for a mobile, you know, what's gonna, what will eventually be a mobile user, um, working user. So, what are my opinions of Starlink? Let's talk about that real quick. Um, I think my thoughts are going to be a little different from somebody who lives in, you know, a rural location where they don't have a high speed availability, um, you know, for internet. But um, I think it works okay. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, like... Um, as it's painted in some cases. I just don't. Um, but I think part of that is because of, you know, I have fiber optic, 300 megabit fiber optic to my house. Um, if I didn't have that or availability to that, I may have a little different opinion. So um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, now that I've used this for four months, what do I think the shortcomings of Starlink are? A um, couple things obstructions big problem um if you have trees they will get in your way um that's probably the biggest one and what i'd like to do is uh i'm going to show you my my kind of visibility map here and this is what i see um for my visibility map with starlink and if you notice i have i have some obstructions to the north which as I gather, is the most important is really to the north. I have some to the west, and obviously some to the east and south, but not a ton of obstructions. I have a pretty, overall here, pretty clear view of the sky. Um, to, to give a little kind of clarity on what these obstructions are, they're trees, there's no doubt about that, but they are not really that close to the dish. Um, the ones to the, to the north in particular, are over 200 feet away on another property entirely. The ones to the wet, to the northwest are across the street and about 150 to 200 feet away. And the ones to the, the south are on another neighbor's property, probably 150 feet away. And this one to the east is also another tree that's on my property that's probably 100 plus feet away. Um, one thing to keep, uh, I should mention too, is my dish. It's not at ground level. My dish is on the roof of a two-story house. 
um, it's probably 35 feet off the ground. And, you know, I don't know how tall these trees are. I have no practical way to measure them. But from the distances these trees are away, you can see it needs kind of a wide cone of sky to really be able to have, you know, effective coverage. Um, so obstructions are definitely an issue. And as you can see here, you know, it says that Starlink is partially obstructed, expect an interruption every 36 seconds. Now, I'm not seeing that. Um, if I look at the log, do I see it? Yes, 100%. I see a lot more, you know, quite frequent interruptions, actually. Um, if I look at my um, statistics here at outages, you'll see I have all these little 2 seconds, sometimes 12 seconds. I get all these little blips, and they seem to happen every few minutes. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the obstructions, and then two, you don't always necessarily at this point, in 2022 anyways, have a satellite that can service your dish everywhere all the time. Uh, I have a coworker who has Starlink as well, and he lives in rural, you know, kind of rural Oklahoma where there's not a tree for miles, and he still has times where he has outages for minutes at a time. Um, because there's just simply no satellite for his dish to communicate with. And that's just kind of kind of the way it is. Um, so those are kind of the biggest shortcomings that I see, see for Starlink. Now, for regular web surfing, so hitting web pages, checking your email, streaming like Netflix, um, or, you know, um, we use Sling TV here. Um, I would assume that YouTube TV is probably pretty similar or Hulu, probably pretty similar in this regard. They seem to deal really, really well with these outages, and there's not too much of an issue with um, with them at all. They, you, know, you might get some buffering here and there, and it'll just pick up where it left off and keep going. The problem with outages like this, as I see it as somebody who spends an inordinate amount of time in meetings, Zoom and Teams, um, I use Teams probably... 75% of the time. And Teams does not like those outages whatsoever. Um, if I'm in like a one hour call, I will get dumped three to four times in that hour minimum, possibly more. Um, and also given that I do, I'm, I'm an IT, IT guy by trade, I spend a lot of time in SSH shell sessions managing Linux servers and storage hardware and switches and all that kind of stuff. Um, SSH doesn't deal well with any sort of, you know, packet loss or disruptions either. And I will get booted out of sessions 50 times a day. Um, neither of those two situations are, you know, certainly not optimal and certainly not good to try to actually be productive while you're trying to work. Um, that's for sure. So that's kind of what brings us to my solution to make this more better, um, you know, more highly available, more, more resilient, um, and just kind of making it actually work for me so that I'll be able to effectively work from the road. Um, and that's this device right here. This is a, um, a device by a company called Peplink. It's a Pepwave Max Transit Pro in my case. This is the one that I bought, but it's, um, this one's a dual cellular 4G LTE modem device that also has a um, a hardware, you know, WAN port for Ethernet. And what the trick is with this and why it's really helping is that they have a product they call Speed Fusion, which Speed Fusion will allows you to bond multiple WAN connections together for high availability, load balancing, and you know, performance considerations. So basically Think of it as a quality of service. It's really kind of what it's, what I, in my opinion that, that Speed Fusion gives you is, is just higher quality of service. You have, you know, in, in this case of this device, you could have up to three WAN connections all servicing your clients. And if one drops off, the others can just kind of take up that load. Now, granted, I do understand that this will not work everywhere. If I don't have availability of cellular, um, if we're boondocking in the desert somewhere and there's no cellular, 
um, yeah, I'm going to have some, maybe have some issues with Starlink, but I think they'll be less frequent than I have them now, given, you know, the trees and things that are in the way. Um, but they'll still exist. The good news is with Starlink anyways, at least that's going to get better over time as they build that constellation out. Um, you know, SpaceX keeps launching rockets with satellites in them. Um, that's, that only stands to get better over time. And hopefully that that kind of cone of the view of the sky that you need will also kind of narrow out some as they have more coverage. But we'll, we will see how that goes going forward. Now, the other pieces I wanted to show you is actually how I have this thing configured. So... Um, let's go into my console here. This is the actual router itself. And as you can see, I have um, a couple of WAN connections right now. I have my Starlink connection. And I have a cellular connection right now over AT&T. Um, you'll also note that both of these are priority one, which is the highest priority. Um, you can arrange these however you want, if you wanted to just do a straight failover from one connection type to another. So say you had Starlink as your priority one, and if it failed, go to priority two. You can do that. Um, but for my usage, using this product called Speed Fusion, you can't really do that. For Speed Fusion to work, you have to have multiple WAN connections all on the same priority. And... So that's why I have both of these as priority one. As you can see, I have, you know, Speed Fusion Cloud uh, tunnel set up and, you know, it's, it's kind of ready to go using both of those connections. Now, a couple things here um, that, I had, that I wanted to consider. Thing number one is, as you can see here, I have four terabytes of you know, data I can transfer over Speed Fusion Cloud and I have till 2025 to use it. That is for any data traveling over that, be it up or down. Um, and it's a finite number. When I run out, I have to basically pay more money to them to get more Speed Fusion data or I have to house my own. Um, you know, I could do that on Amazon or whatever. There's, there's ways around that. I don't want to get into that in this video. But um, I want to keep that usage kind of really, really focused on my, my business or work activities. Um, but I also want to be able to control where traffic goes. Um, so I want to be able to control my other clients. So my, you know, my personal laptop or my iPad or, you know, her stuff, whatever, TVs, all that. I want to be able to control where their traffic goes. And as it sits right now, the way, you know, just based on on this WAN, these two WAN connections or possibly three being, you know, all at the same priority, it's just going to pick one and use it. Um, whichever one responds first is going to use. So I don't have a good way to control this. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about and show you how I have this set up because of what I'm trying to do is granularly control where my clients go and what path they take. Um there's other pieces of this too. Like I want to be able to control the usage on this cellular connection is another, another example. This one belongs to my company and technically I'm not supposed to use it for any purposes other than conducting business related to my job. Um, I do plan to add a third one. I have not vetted out a provider yet, so I don't have the SIM yet, but I'm, but I will have one. And the other, but the other thing to consider with cell plans, and this is something, you know, if you do some research, you'll, you'll find that what I've found, there is no such thing as an unlimited cell phone plan. Um, they use the term unlimited because absolutely you could transmit as much data as you can consume. The problem is they're never going to let you do it because what ends up happening is you get throttled. And for instance, this AT&T connection through my company you know, is, is on a corporate plan. We have a giant pool. It's technically unlimited. But after 150 gigabytes, I am going to be throttled down to like 128K, um, which is so slow you almost can't do anything with it. So I'll have 4GLT data 
right up until 100 until I hit that 120 gigabytes in a in a billing cycle, and then they're gonna just cut the cord and, and give me essentially dial up. Um, it just that just doesn't uh, that just doesn't work. So let's see, what am I doing to to kind of control this? Well, there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, thing number one is through Speed Fusion Cloud. Um, they have some pre-canned ways to control traffic. First one being you can do it by application. You can create a new SSID, or you can connect specific clients. Some of these things would work for me, like this would work for me, and this would work for me. Only problem is then I don't have a great way to control my non-speed fusion traffic. It's still that will still just kind of pick and choose, you know, wherever it wants to go. So what I've done here is I've set up multiple networks um, and different VLANs. So this untagged LAN is the kind of the default LAN that comes on the device. I have one I made called Starlink Preferred, which has its own unique IP space. Another one called Speed Fusion VPN, which also has its own unique IP space. I also have associated those with corresponding wireless SSIDs. Because this device is, you know, kind of an enterprise class device. You can have a whole bunch of different wireless SSIDs, bunches of VLANs, all sorts of stuff like that. So that, that's what I'm doing here. So if you connect to the Starlink preferred Wi-Fi, you'll be on that 10.0.2 network. If you're on the Speed Fusion VPN, you'll be on that 10.0.3. What that allows me to do is set some outbound policy. And this is how I'm controlling that traffic. So what I've done here is you notice I have one called Starlink. And I'll open the policy up so you can see it. Um, basically, any any traffic on that 10.0.2 network is going to get prioritized based off of um, basically a priority I have set here. Um, in this case, I have Starlink as the highest priority. And then Cellular 2, Cellular 1, which I don't own yet. I can also set up um, Wi-Fi WAN. So if I'm somewhere like a RV park that has really great Wi-Fi, I can add this to the mix and leverage it so that my clients can just use it without having to reconfigure anything on the client side. Um, when I do get my own personal SIM, I will drag this cellular two out. So that way I'll no longer be using it for any kind of personal traffic. Um, You'll also notice here a um, couple things. It says when no connections are available, you can either drop the traffic or fall through to the next rule. In this case, I don't have any other rule for traffic on this network, so I'm just going to drop the traffic. Um, it'll just fail if there's no connections available. And the other piece is um, this terminate sessions on connection recovery. What, what that does is if Starlink is available, it will use it. If it goes away, it'll move to the next one. If Starlink comes back, it will kill the connection on the on the one it had failed over to and then go back to using Starlink. So it just basically reverts it back to where it was for the instead of, you know, if you have a session like you're watching a video, um, instead of remaining on the cellular connection, it'll revert it back to Starlink, which is kind of what I want to be able to do. So the next rule is for speed fusion. And you'll notice here, this one's a little simpler. Um, same thing, the source is any, any device on this 10.0.3 network this time. And it's gonna have an enforced connection over the speed fusion cloud VPN that, I, that I've established. So any, any client on that network is gonna go over the VPN. Now the other piece that I wanted to do with this is balance that traffic out. Um, as we talked about earlier with throttling, um, I do not want to use up my entire data plan in very short order. I want it to be able to last an entire month before it throttles me. Um, so what I have here is I have Starlink as the highest priority uh, or the highest weight on this weighted balance scale. So it's going to try to use it the most. And then I've kind of ratcheted back the two cellulars so that um, it will send the traffic, some of the traffic over the cellular, but not all of it. 
Um, if I didn't do this, what would happen is with Speed Fusion, it would divide the traffic up equally amongst the two or three WAN connections that I have. And again, I don't want to get into a situation where even with my work stuff, that I get to the point where I'm throttled at the end of the month on my work, you know, cellular sim. I want to keep that usage just under that amount if I can, or even less, um, never hurts anything. You know, the less I use, the better, basically. So I can also add the Wi-Fi WANs into the mix if I had any. I could, you know, I could ratchet that up a little bit. Um, what I found in practice here, looking at the actual logs, um, you know, I my day-to-day -day use, I'll be about probably on my work sim, 50, 60 gigabytes a month, um, maybe a little bit more. And of course, over Starlink, as I'm using it right now, um, you know, I'm using a lot more. I'm using hundreds of gigabytes a month just for work. Um, so, you know, that, that actual kind of weighted balance thing seems to be working out well, f you know, for this usage. It seems to be working really, really good. So, um, I guess that's pretty much kind of how I have this set up. It's, um, there's really, there's really not much more to it. Um, you know, like I, like I had said, I'm trying to control where my tra what where you know what computers can go to what connection type and kind of control my traffic and this device enables me to do that and it also gives me the ability to bond cellular with Starlink to kind of make it the the best of both worlds. Now, how is this working in reality? Um, it is working fantastic. I'm having absolutely zero issues um, with. Uh, you know, with my work stuff, no more drop zoom, no more drop zoom, no more drop teams. Um, all that is working fine. And um, it's really, really been great. So um, I guess the one other thing I probably, people are probably wondering, why didn't I go with 5G device? Why did I go 4G LTE? Simple reason on that is uh, two reasons, cost and performance. So um, these devices in a in a 5G are significantly more money. Um, back when I bought my unit, the only one they had was over $6,000 versus about a little over 1000 for the unit that I bought. Um, the other reason is really performance. Um, the difference between 4G and 5G in actual real-world usage isn't that great. It, um, you know, you still are dependent on the backhaul off the towers, and you're still dividing that backhaul amongst all of the users. So, you know, if that, you know, if that tower's backhaul is only a say a one gigabit connection, and you're divided up amongst a thousand users, you're never going to get the full performance of five G anyway. Um, realistically, it's going to be about the same as four. So why take on the extra expense for a technology that's really still in its infancy and maturing? Um, it did make sense to me. So, um, you know, in the future. Will I consider a 5G device? Maybe. But for now, I think the 4G device um, offers plenty enough performance. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been working great for me. So I see no reason to uh, invest all that extra money at this point. So that's all I got. I just wanted to kind of show you my configuration, what I'm doing here, and talk about how it made, how much better it's made Starlink work for me. I'm very confident uh, in that when we do go on the road, that we're going to have no issues working. Um, it's going to work great for us. So um, but that that's about it. And uh, any questions, comments, concerns, whatever, uh, hit me up in the comments. And thanks for watching.